Welcome to a Chat with Heart podcast. I'm your host, Christina Martin. I'm here to help guide heartfelt conversations with new and old friends I've met from just being alive or touring my music around North America and other parts of the world. I chat with people I feel a kinship with and that I genuinely believe we can learn from. Our personal stories have great power to heal, influence, and inspire. All we have to do is show up for the conversation. Just talk about it. We could shut up. special guest introducer for the first little blurp, blurp, blurp of my podcast today. He's one of my besties and he's been living with us for a week now. And his name, you're going to, you guys, he's been of like a, he's one of the most downloaded episodes. It's not Dale. He's one of the most. He's a, he's like second or third, I think second. And he's right here, and I'm staring at him, so I'm just going to say his name. It's Matt Epp. Uh, oh, can, oh, wait, am I, I'm clapping for me. And we're going to insert is this him. Is this me fighting to, like, climb the ranks? Yes. Yeah, like, the in downloaded, yeah. But really, though, people, I think it speaks to your uh, audience that you, you, you know, when you just made a share and people are like, I want to get to know Matt Epp more. And uh, it's probably because I talk know. about you all the time, and it's like I want to hear what Matt talks to Christina or Christina talks to Matt about. Well, well, you know what? What, folks? What? If you want to hear us talk more with each other? Mm-hmm. We are about to record an episode for Matt's podcast, "Swimming in Slurping Water." <laughs> That's what it's called, right? It's it's a long title, "Drinking the Water." Drinking the Water podcast has been on a hiatus. It's been a dry year. Boom, boom, boom. And what are we gonna? Have you ever had a guest announcer for your for your introductions before? No, this is fun. I like this. What are we introducing? Well, Ooh. okay. Well, so I, I have prepared a little something. Um, you would love this guest today. Uh, I hope you get to meet him someday. Maybe you already know him. Who's that? Well, hold on a second now. Um, Okay, so Matt, first of all, I have the little thing prepared. Matt, you being one of my favorite people, it's appropriate that you are here. You are also the wind beneath my wings, Christina. <laughs> you interrupted me <laughs> here in this intro. Taste your own medicine. For one of my own, own favorite <laughs> humans. You know there are friends that you make in life that make you feel relaxed and vibrant with a mm. particular frequency, frequency that equals joy. Cute. Ian Foster, native of Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. Canada. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's, do you know this Ian? Is, this do you know yeah, Ian? I do. How do you know Ian? Well, from going to Newfoundland. Oh. Um, I met him a couple. I like, I remember he had this really great hook in a song. The first time I heard it, it was something like when, if the weather holds. When doves fly. Is that, oh, is that, is that his too? <laughs> Maybe. No, but go ahead. If the weather holds, um, I think if there's a B minor involved, I heard him play it. Don't and, look at me like I know every single lyric or change you or must minor know Ian. major in Ian's I, songs. I, I don't. heard some of this in advance, some of this podcast actually, and um, here in your home, and it's a good one. It, it, he's he's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay, back to my little. Uh, oh yeah. So uh, so he's a storyteller. Music and film are the ways he tells stories. I mean, that being said, he just opens his mouth with, and he's like just always telling stories. He has a great podcast as well. Um, he's launched a new film uh, with an accompanying album, and it's called Close to the Bone. It's stunning. It's also a subtitled film, which is really cool. Hmm. Um, so he is also one of my favorite humans and, um, Ian's toured all over the place, Canada, the U S Germany, the Netherlands, Australia. Nope. I didn't say that. Maybe he's never been there. Austria though. And Italy, he is a music NL and ECMA 
winner, a finalist for the International Songwriting Competition, and has numerous co-writes to his credit, including the legendary folk songwriter Ron Hines. Oh, sweet. Yes. Um, Ian performs and records both solo and as a duo with his longtime partner, Nancy Hines, with whom he released the multi-award winning album A Week in December. That's from 2018. And he makes me laugh. So let's get to know Ian more. And let's say goodbye to Matt Epp for now. So join Matt Epp and I over on Drinking the Water and Mm. check out Matt's new album. It's called Rolling Rolling Wave. Wave. Okay, let's get to know. Let's get to know Ian Foster a little more. That sounded creepy. Hey there. Hi. And thank you for your time today. That was great. <laughs> it was so good. People are gonna love it. <laughs> I love these short episodes. Is this what is this what TikTok is? <laughs> They're so underrated. Um, yeah. And we did we don't even have to dance. That's amazing. Although it looks like you have a bit of a, a, a dance floor right behind you there. Yeah, that's what I set it up for is, uh, you know, this is my pivot. My pandemic pivot is dancing in front of a black background. Ian Foster, you are a hustler. (laughs) You, (laughs) you are though. Uh, Is this, is this the first question of every podcast for you? Are you a hustler? I don't think I've ever asked anyone if they were a hustler, but I, I strategized it for our chat because I know that you are. And I feel like we have, I feel like we have that in common. Like we've, that we both have had to, in some ways, like in lots of ways we've been embraced in other ways, we've been probably experienced enough rejection to the last us 10 lifetimes. And as a result, we have, uh, because we're hustlers, we have managed to, just keep going and what what do you think is the proper level of rejection that you because i think there is a proper level i think if you don't receive any you're probably an asshole and if you receive too much you are curled up in a in a ball on the floor like there's a right amount of rejection we should all have well if we want to do like a percentage i'd say (laughs) like uh let's say out of um i'd say 60 to 70 percent rejection rate means right. you're doing like you're pretty normal uh right. if it's a if it's a hundred percent you should probably find another like i think you should give up give it up <laughs> trying for sure and what if it's 99 and you're like i'm just holding on to that one time someone oh, said good job you then know? you should take a look at that thing that you weren't rejected for and only focus on that i have news for you it was dancing that was the thing. So that's why I set up this background. Oh, I'm so <laughs> proud of you. And I wish we could do a live, like the viewers could, you're dancing right now. Tap. That's as a matter right. of fact, very, yeah. Yes. We could, we could put it in and post some tapping and they'll be like, I guess he was dancing the whole time while he was talking. That is, that is difficult. Um, uh, it's funny. I was, I was just on your website and speaking of hustle, I was like, man, Christina, as usual, has it all together. Like you, there's so many different things happening there between the Patreon and the podcast and the tours and the songs. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, first of all, I feel like I've got nothing going on, but you probably know how that feels as well. Have you done that where someone says, what are you up to? And then you're like, not much. And then you list the things and they're like, you just said eight things. (laughs) Probably probably been doing that for the duration of the pandemic. Uh, But it's because it's, you know, there's the thing that you want to be doing all the time. And then there are the other things you're interested in, curious about, like maybe you're doing them just to pay the bills, um, you know, but they, they they kind of take you away from maybe that that thing that you're like the most passionate about, maybe. Um, or like, you know, in the case of you went to my website, which is so funny because like, Who's fucking interviewing who here? Like, you, you're doing you. Did you do research for this podcast episode where I'm supposed to be interviewing you? 
I did. About your childhood. No, no, stop. <laughs> because we did this on your on on your podcast, if and when. Uh, let's cut right to the chase. Like, were you bullied as a child? Uh, you know, I want to dig into trauma and pivotal life experiences. <laughs> What's your backup plan? You know, just we should just do you should just have a podcast <laughs> yeah. of the most infuriating musician questions. That would be hilarious. Well, now I want to ask you what your backup plan was and if you ever had one. Because I mean, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I ha- I had one. What was your backup plan? I was gonna be a cruise sales specialist. A, a what, sorry? Like a cru- like a cruise, like a vacation cruise specialist? <laughs> Yeah, so I was going out with this guy. I was living with him, and like, I don't, I think, I don't think he was, he was, I mean, it came up in therapy. Like, he was not excited about the fact that I was always broke and trying to be a musician. And, and I, I think I uh, got the best of me, uh, the people pleaser in me, you know, was like, okay, uh, I got to do something else. But I thought, I thought the travel industry, would satisfy me. So I bought into this, like, there's this franchise, you can buy packages and become like part of the the company. And so I did that, did the training and uh, I sold a uh, cruise to my boyfriend and I sold a wedding package to a couple who was divorced a year later. Th- those are my only two sales. Um, did, did you, uh, did you have a backup plan? Uh, I don't know about backup plan. I was thinking the other day, I was talking to a friend about professions, uh, like what you wanted to be when you grew up. And I I had a very limited number of things. In kindergarten, I remember when they asked you that question, you had to draw what you wanted to be. And I wanted to be an ambulance driver. And I couldn't spell ambulance, which you had to write on the picture because you're drawing an ambulance. And I'm like, I don't think this career is going to work out. I can't spell. Oh, man. So, you, you would have been a great ambulance driver. Right? It was bad. crushed early. I was, yeah. I was, I, 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 I found rejection early, you know, really. Uh, that was my first rejection. No. Uh, and then I wanted to be a marine biologist for some reason for a while. I mean, no offense to marine biologists, it's a noble profession, but I, I don't yeah. know where it came from. It's sort of like those early childhood things you're like, like no one in my family was an ambulance driver. I have no idea why. I probably saw one and was like, they look cool. I had a, probably had a little toy or something. I don't know. It's all so arbitrary at that age. Mm-hmm. And then when I got to university, I wanted to be a journalist. That was probably the first thing I put actual like adult effort into. Like I actually did write articles for newspapers and worked at the university newspaper as the editor, the arts editor and all that stuff, you know, and Ooh. interviewed. I had some pretty amazing experiences from that time. I interviewed the Moffats. If you remember the Moffats. I thought at first my thought was the Muppets. Uh <laughs> So I'm not sure who the Moffats are, but the Moffats. Oh, they were like a like a boy band, like a young boy band that were hot for a minute. Like Google, Google the Moffats. You'll you'll find lots of stuff. And they were playing at a stadium, and it was all like screaming girls. And I went in, and their songs were like super pop, like teen pop. And I was like, oh "What are your influences?" I was obviously a good journalist, and uh, yeah. and they said uh, they were like Nirvana, and I'm like, no, I don't think so. I don't think. It's it's that not was, clear. It's not clear of, from the music. That was part of their press training. They're like, you, if this is asked, you need to say Nirvana. Yeah. Uh, Try to be cool. Try yeah. to be cool. You know, don't these, say Menudo yeah. or whatever. Uh, these are they the actually dr- sound like. <laughs> yeah, these are the drugs that you do. Uh, yeah. When you're off days. <laughs> exactly. They're and, like yeah. acetaminophen. You know, and you're like, really? It's just for headaches. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So so that was uh, that. I was going to go to journalism school, and in my last year um, of university. I, I was sort of like, I, I just realized everything, like all the journalism I was doing, like all the stories were just bands. I just wanted to talk to bands. I just wanted to be around musicians. I, every course I did, if I could figure out a way to like talk about music, then I did. And of course was playing at the time, but was viewing it as like, this must be, you know, this is that hobby. This is that whatever. And so in my last year, I was like, this is, you know, this is, I, I actually would rather do this. I'd rather be on the other side of the microphone. I'd rather be like spending my days, like always thinking about music instead of like trying to shoehorn ways to think about it through yeah. profession, you know? So that would have probably been the backup plan had yeah. I done that, you know? And thank God I didn't. Cause even at that age, I think I was like, how much do journalists make? Oh, really? I could probably make that plan in bars for God's sakes. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's all, it was all tr- good training for, 
for your career. I mean, because I'm sure you've had times, I shouldn't assume, but I know I have where like you're doing your own press releases. You're, you have to write a lot of things. You're writing grants and and now you've got your own podcast too. And, and uh, I think you're a wonderful host. Oh my, well, thank you. You know, I've only done the one season and it's now been a few years, which is crazy to think, but that's, that's sort of, uh, I was gearing up for another season, the pandemic hit and everything just sort of, you know, did the thing that it it does, you know? So Mm, I've I've just started thinking about it again, you know? Oh yeah. Um, You can uh, always go back to it. Anyway, back to trauma. No. So you grew up, you're from Newfoundland and Labrador. I am from Newfoundland. Oh, sorry. So what's with the, so is it bad if I don't say and Labrador. Uh, yeah, you're actually, you'll receive a letter in the mail. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. When you were growing up, was it Newfoundland and Labrador? Uh, n- uh, yes, it is. Um, it was. <laughs> it will be. Like at one point in school, were you like slapped on the wrist with a ruler if you, what? Uh... No, not really. Not really. I <laughs> mean, Labrador was discussed, of course, you know. Do you but, have you ever, uh, have you ever even been there like does it even it's real i actually have i've been there uh twice so far and i went there with the creative arts festival which was this great multidisciplinary festival where it was just like a chance to see little communities i went to sheshashi and uh, uh northwest river and black tickle and like all these places that like even if you travel there recreationally you probably wouldn't go to at least a couple of those so it was like you know one of those things that i'm i know you've experienced like when you go somewhere for music and there's like a a purpose to going to a particular town like you end up going to places that no tourist would ever go to yeah like yarmouth nova scotia (laughs) (laughs) now it's just it's sort of out of the way doesn't cost quite as much to get there as it does for you to get to uh i don't know if you knew this my dad is from nova scotia so Where? I spent all my summers growing up. Um, the Annapolis Valley. He's from just outside of Greenwood. He grew oh. up on a farm there. Oh, yeah. that's a, it's just a lovely, lovely part of our province. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. where everyone goes to pick apples, drink wine. Yes. I once raced an ostrich at Oakland Zoo. I was going to ask. That was one of my questions. Have you I know. ever spent you time with, with an ostrich? So you're saying that uh, there's a hobby farm somewhere where – People rut, ride ostriches? No, no. Um, it was a zoo, I guess. I don't. I guess it may not be open anymore. I don't know. I was obviously uh, quite young, twenty-seven. Uh, kidding. Uh, <laughs> but like, I, <laughs> I was a little kid, and I was there for summer vacation, and there was an ostrich. And uh, this is all, of course, like I was young enough that I don't really remember this. So this is all recounted through my parents' storytelling to me. Mm. So. You know, this could be uh, disinformation or misinformation. You know, I know you don't want to spread that on your podcast, but no, it's you know. okay. I mean, it's all right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I know how vigilant the ostrich community can be. So uh, I'm going to, this is where I'm going to start getting trolled online. Yeah. Not you, me. Cause yeah. Oh, I understand. Cause they're going to be like, uh, again with the ostrich misinformation you know again um yeah so so when i was a kid i there was an ostrich there and i looked at it through the fence and i was sort of like just sizing him up and then i went to walk away and he sort of mirrored my steps and then i was like stopped and he stopped and i looked at him and then i like walked a few more paces and he like he kept walking pace with me and then I like started into a brisk walk and then he started into a brisk walk and then I started into like an all out run. And again, the way my parents tell the story, like people stopped what they were doing to turn to watch this like Spielberg esque moment of this like man versus beast of this little child running on one side of the fence and this ostrich, like easily, easily keeping up pace on the other side, just slightly ahead of me, like just ahead. And then when we finished the race at the other end, he did this little dance like, I see, I beat you. That is so cute. It was cute. I was devastated. Further rejection early in life that I was like lost to this ostrich. Oh, now this is, I wish that we had cell phones back then and your parents were just like filming everything and you could have been a child star. Exactly. And we'd be on this now and you'd be like, uh, welcome ostrich, man. Yeah. Ian Foster. And I'd be like, I'm also a musician, you know, and I just spend the rest of my life saying I'm also a musician in the world. (laughs) 
Oh, and that is this would be going your, well? That would that's be your I, trauma. That would be your trauma, and that's what we focus on on a chat with heart podcast. Yeah. And I'd say things like, "I just wanted to bury my head in the sand, and you try not to laugh." Yeah. <laughs> I, I. This is a serious question. All right. Okay. Have you ever considered stand-up comedy? Because I do find that you are one of the funniest people uh, that I've ever met. Wow. Ever met? I think so. I just think you're really like, mm, I mean, don't get too, you know, big headed here, but like, um, you know, a lot of words, you're really uh, quick, uh, witted, um, and I don't, you just have a remarkable memory for things. And I just, I don't know if those things work with comedy, but uh, I just find you funny and I just could see you doing a great stand up act, at least. Can I just say, and minutes. I don't want to sound egotistical here, I've, I've, I've won awards, I have accolades, but you saying you know a lot of words might be the greatest <laughs> compliment anyone's ever given me. That's such a beautiful sentiment. <laughs> I'm not really sure what that means in relation to comedy, but I do. Like you probably, well, I just, I just find that um, it's handy to know words, <laughs> to be able to speak English really well. Yes, I, I believe, uh, I believe Nietzsche said that uh, it's <laughs> handy to know a lot of words. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I just think if you if you did need another Plan B, um, then that's one one place, one direction you could go. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just thought you'd be great at it. Oh, um, that's sweet. That's sweet. Yeah, I mean, I love comedy so much. Like, I listen to, like, I would say at this point, like, of the podcasts I listen to, um, other than this one, of course, like, it's uh, it's a lot of comedy. I am I'm I love comedy podcasts and, and comedians and stuff. Um, uh, I, 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 do, I do not think I am a comedian in terms of a professional sense. But, um, yeah, I... I I definitely, um, years ago, actually, I remember hearing Jan Arden talk about this and, you know, people have talked about her telling jokes on stage and she was like, I'm just trying to balance out all my sad songs. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I yeah. totally relate. It's same. like, cause you're, you are the same. You're quite funny on stage. And, uh, and I, I was going to ask you kind of a similar question of like, uh, cause I almost feel like that's part of the dynamic of the show at this point for me, like the stories, like I'm not up there telling, you know, one liners or anything like that. It's just like the stories, you know, I do have beats in the show that are funnier. And I'm like, yeah, cause I, I have a lot of sad ballads and sad songs and it's like, you know, it, it's sort of yeah. like, uh, that's the version of taking the show up and down, you know, that you need to have to put together a show. It should make you laugh and cry to, you know, as the cliche goes. Yeah. Tension release for sure. Okay. So I know why I have, songs like that um but i i mean i we talked a lot about a lot of things in in the past and i mean i, I guess uh i don't know that much about you you that i would think you've had a traumatic background growing up or anything maybe you have and this is what we're going to get at here but like sure why do you think you're drawn to writing songs like th that are let's say, and more melancholy or sad or touching? Uh, it, simply put, tears give me strength. I, I've, I've thought about this uh, at different times, I guess, over the years because uh, uh, probably a broader question uh, or a broader subject we uh, every musician I know thinks about is purpose, right? Like when we're in the arts, I mean, you know, uh, it, it's a very strange profession to ultimately be saying, what do you think of my soul every time you put something out to the world? Like that's... You know, that's been the problem or the challenge, I should say, excuse me, since the beginning of, of I suppose, any artist releasing anything is that, you know, it's so much, uh, you, you're leaving yourself so vulnerable and open a lot. Um, and and so recently I heard Springsteen say something that I thought was uh, really beautiful. He, he was talking about uh, uh, being a fraud. He was saying like, you know, I, I'm this blue collar, like voice of the blue collar worker, you know, that's kind of the reputation, but he's like, I never worked a job like that in my life, you know? But then he said, uh, my dad did though. And mm. he's like, I've just realized like, I'm kind of an agent for my father, you know, like that he worked all these jobs and had this life and he wasn't going to ever tell those stories in a broader context. Like he, his life would ultimately go 
you know, sort of uh, unnoticed in that bigger sense, the way that I guess many, most lives do, you know, most li any life not lived in the public eye, you know, is, is, is obviously private. So um, I thought that was a really beautiful way to talk about, you know, telling stories for those who don't have the voice to tell them or, you know, a story that, whether that's like a really personal, like family story, or even a story that um, you're told by someone else. Like I, for, for years, especially when I was touring really heavily, I was like, it's almost like a weird form of organic machine. You know, you'd write songs, you put them on a record, you go out and you tour and you would inevitably have all these very profound and cathartic experiences because you'd be in new places and meeting new people. And sometimes it'd be places where it's not, you know, people are speaking to you in their second language and there's sort of a mystery and there's those barriers and you want to break them down. And, and you'd have these really wonderful moments and perspectives that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And then someone tells you an amazing story and then you, you know, that connects with you and you write a song about it and then you put it on another record and then the process begins again, you know? Um, so for me that, uh, um, I suppose like uh, that that's always felt special to me as a reason to do it. You know, it's not, it's not just like trying to write a pop hit or something. It's trying to like tell a story that connected with me and then therefore may connect with someone else. And uh, really it's about, you know, connection and communication. I mean, all of it is this stuff is what we're doing right now. Like it's why I did a podcast it was like a chance to talk to, people that I'd had chats with before in my case, the so season one, anyway, it was like people that I had had already had those kind of conversations where it was like, yeah, hey, it's too bad. We weren't rolling a microphone. This is a really great chat. Like that thing you say. And then, uh, you know, obviously writing songs and touring and, you know, it, it's all, it all feeds back to that conversation, that connection. You know, I've read a, a lot of your press that says, you know, he's a good storyteller, storyteller this, storyteller that, blah, 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 storyteller. Uh, so answer this. Um, Man with guitar just didn't what? fly. So. <laughs> well, how did, so what, okay, well, first of all, I want you to think about what you think makes you a good storyteller. Was there a storytelling in your family? And I know it's a big part of, uh, I think, I think the Newfoundland and Labrador culture go yeah it's <laughs> i gotta go i'm gonna go get some coffee all right sounds you go good ahead and yeah you can listen back later and see if it was any good um yeah i mean obviously it's it's hard to self-analyze that way sometimes um because i think it it's not even about like modesty or anything else or like or 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 lack thereof it, it, it's just like uh it, i think the process of learning how to do that just happens uh like everything you just said probably is is true like all those things like it's not an or it's like you know the culture you come out of and you know uh years of doing it like it happens so organically and so slowly over time like i i would say to any artist coming from uh well i guess any town even a bigger town because you'll still if you've grown up there you'll still have your circles like i think going on the road was very important to me early on, you know, and my first tour was in Nova Scotia, like in 2000, I want to say 2007. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just remember playing at the, uh, the Spitfire Arms Ale House in Windsor, Nova Scotia. And, uh, and definitely no one giving a shit that I was there. And I remember being like, good. Like it felt, it felt good in a weird sort of way. Cause I, I think I realized right from the start, that um, when you're from any kind of small place and people all love to talk about like, oh, you're from a really music oriented city. And it's like, yeah, but if you're not like ingrained in the music community, which I wasn't from the beginning, like mm -hmm. I didn't come from a, like a musical royalty family or anything in Newfoundland yeah. or like have like family members or friends who were like successful gigging musicians or anything. It was literally me going. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. The only reason we're doing this is because I thought you were related to David Foster. <laughs> Well, I am. I'm talking about Newfoundland. I didn't tell anyone that because I didn't want to be judged differently. But uh, I actually wrote Because You Loved Me, the Celine Dion song. Like, I didn't uh, want to say it's paid for all this, all this. That's what I thought. Yeah. And that's really all I needed to hear. Do you know that I have had um, like at least 10 times had people at shows and they would be like cafe shows, like in some random town who would go, 
are you related to David Foster? <laughs> and I just want to go, do you think I would be here if yeah. I was related to David Foster? <laughs> I probably would. Yeah. No, that's that doesn't surprise me. I mean, you know, I've got the Ricky Martin thing a lot, too. Oh, my. Are yeah. you serious? No. Yeah. But no, that no. would be funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that would be. And you'd be like, yeah, I'm doing these shows to try to break out on my own from under the Ricky Martin impressive umbrella. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I think uh, for me, um, uh, like I just realized early on that uh, it was important to um, really understand whether you're any good or not by going on the road and playing for strangers, right? Like just to, because, uh, you know, if you play, like when you're at home, you know this, it's like, you know, your aunt is going to come out or your, your cousins are going to be there and your friends from high school. And they're probably going to be the people talking the loudest because they know you so well. And you're just Ian or Christina up there on stage. And it's like, it, it just feels like a really different kind of show when you're starting out, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and you're connected somehow to everybody in the audience. So you have no understanding of like, what is going to really work? Like what, what is the best song in your set? Like what is the best moment that, really gets everybody like the only way to know that is to just go out and be on the road and play for strangers night after night and be like after a while you're like shit it, this song works everywhere wow yeah. there must be something to that you know mm -hmm. yeah. and i think like so that's a very long tangent to, to answer your question to say like just like i did that with songs like i felt like talking to the audience which is really hard at first it's not like i was over at spitfire m's ale house regaling people with stories i was like playing songs hoping no one throw a bottle at me you know so it's like for me it was it was it was just getting more comfortable and then realizing like how powerful that could be and you could win over you can win over strangers like a lot easier with stories like you know this too yeah. if you're playing venues where like no one knows any of your songs Hey guys, get ready for the next 45 minutes. You know, like, mm -hmm. uh, you don't expect to sing along though, you yeah. know, because you don't know the songs yet, you know? So yeah. those stories would often be like, uh, I think it's like throwing an anchor to the audience to be like, all right, we're here together. We're having an experience. Like, come with me. You'll hear the story and then I'll play the song. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll probably even remember the song via the story. You'd be like, what was that one about? You know, and they'll mention the story somehow. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think I thought about it for myself, how I developed that. And so listening to your, I mean, it was, it was the exact same thing. And it, it, there was also, you know, the fact that I have never had any hits. People don't know what my songs are about. And, and, and especially in listening rooms or even in, in Europe, um, they would let, like, I, I find that they're quicker to connect to the song if there's a little bit of sharing before. And I mean, say whatever you want, like oh, a song shouldn't need that, but I think it's helped. And people have said after, I'm glad you shared that story, or maybe sometimes it's a funny story. Sometimes it's just, you know, it's like that mix of, um, of uh, humor and sometimes seriousness and, and where people just, I think really appreciate seeing somebody be themselves on stage because that is hard. And ultimately I think that's one of the, um, the coolest things in our lives is when you can just be yourself. And you I'm know, so glad you said that because that is yeah. that. <laughs> Merry Christmas! I didn't say thanks. I said I was glad you yeah. said. <laughs> and happy birthday! It's Merry Christmas. <laughs> um, well, it's been uh, a while since I've given you a gift, and I just—that's true. I, I and my, my knowledge is gift enough. You know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, no, but it's such a good point. Like, I don't think people think enough about that. Like how uh, the machinations we all go through, like the labyrinths we go through to just be yourself on stage. And you even think you are at first, right? You're like, I'm going to be me. And then you're up there and you're like, I all doing tonight. And it just ra you know, razzle dazzle. It's like horrible. You know? I give myself pep talks like during the song, like fuck, calm the fuck down. Chill it. When this song ends, you better be yourself again. Like, Whatever happened there between the last song, that was not you. Calm the fuck down. These people are not interested in a fake. Like, uh, yeah. and then I forget the lyrics of the songs because I'm, you know, not being present. Uh, do you? Do you? Uh, I have to change up stories. Like, I think of maybe again back to the listening to a lot of stand ups. Like, I relate to stand ups, even though I'm a musician, because I 
I feel like with the stories between the songs, like you kind of have to do similar like comedic things. Even if the story is not funny, it's not about it being like comedy. It's about like it could be a very heartfelt story that you're used to telling, but yeah. you have to do something different with it for yourself because it just starts to become like stale. You just feel like you're, yeah, you're doing a recitation instead of like a connection. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and you know, I can, I can do, make something sound a story sound fresh if I know. I don't know anybody in the audience. It's a brand new market, brand new town. And uh, I somehow can take myself back to like, as if I've just told the story for the first time. It sort of feels like I, I it's weird. Be, I've never tried to explain this, but um, it's like I am acting and playing a part, but I'm also tap. I guess I'm, I'm not an actress, but oh, fuck, maybe I am. Maybe that's my plan B. No. That's really tough. I mean, from my side of, uh, you know, directing shorts and stuff, you know, it's like I've said to actor friends of mine, like, I'm like, I, I'm really glad you do what you do. I would never, ever want to do it. I love, I love uh, films, obviously. Uh, I love working in that medium. I love actors. I love chatting with them and, you know, all that stuff. And, and of course, working with them from a directorial standpoint. But I'm like, I just... It is so uh, – talk about that mechanization of what we're talking about, of like how to go through all the pathways you have to to then be natural, you know. Mm. And and there's tons of psychology around that, uh, you know. Well, you brought it up, film, because this is another thing you excel at. I mean, uh, 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 and, I mean, let's get it out of the way. You're here to promote Close to the Bone, a new album too, and single coming out. Let's just get this out of the fucking way. Like <laughs> – just come on you know how your enthusiasm is making me want to open up i know i watched i was privy to being one of the early viewers of close to the bone and getting to hear the music and it was so stunning and i booked a meeting with you because i wanted to pick your brain about the process and um i just it's it, you know your work this isn't the only film you've done, but the, you know, you, I think your work is stunning. But I'd love for you to just tell us about the project and what's what we can expect, what's coming up, and what you're excited about. So yeah, I, I've I've made a couple of films uh, since uh, I guess it's been the last ten years. Uh, I kind of have started this other um, parallel career in film, and it came about through composing for film, other people's films, and getting to see. Films in different stages of undress, you know, when you're a composer, you're seeing stuff, you know, definitely pre-colored, but like also pre like sometimes, you know, especially in the indie world, sometimes it's not even the final edit, you know, of the film. So, you know, through composing, I, I directed, ended up directing my first film, you know, just total indie, you know, cost uh, the cost of buying food for everybody, like, you know, hiring friends who weren't even actors, you know, like the thing you're really supposed to do that every yeah. like that is legit what you should do because mm -hmm. like you don't know anything so you might as well get other people who don't know anything and you can all not know stuff together you can but, be like, confident in your not knowingness exactly a lot of equality on that set yeah. no one knows anything you know um and there's something there's, there's there's something really i think freeing about that though that uh you know because maybe it's not that people are not people are working extra hard but they're doing it for all the right reasons and I don't know. I, I just I, I'm I like that place of to work in that state of mind of like totally. We get totally. nothing to lose. Uh, oh my god! It was it's like being in a garage band, right? It's the same. It's just me and my friends jamming in the garage. Mm. See if we can get a gig. You know, like it's sort of like that part of the process. You know. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I made that film and it did some stuff. And then I made another film with a program called Picture Start, which uh, is a provincial program here in Newfoundland, uh, that gives you like a scaled up budget to make a short, which is really great because it's a learning program. So you actually learn all the roles and, you know, how it all works and go through the whole process, you know, yeah. as if it's a real film, quote unquote, you know, uh, and of course it is. And, and so that did some more stuff and, and I, I'd done some music videos over the years. And then really like all of that sort of led to close to the bone, which is like me trying to meld those two worlds of like music and film, you know? So mm -hmm. instead of being a musician making a film or, you know, whatever a filmmaker who put some of his music in a film, you know, uh, this, this was truly like uh, the, it's close to the bone, the, the film and 
album like it's the 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 album has 12 tracks five of them plus like stems from other tracks are the soundtrack and the principal really the storyteller i mean the film is is a subtitled film you know there's no there's no actual dialogue in the film the music helps to tell the story uh but it is still a narrative story it's not just a series of music videos it's not it's not fully esoteric in nature you know what i mean it, it has a plot for lack of a better term um so so yeah that was that was a really uh i guess ambitious thing perhaps you know to do some might say foolhardy but it was uh, uh <laughs> sometimes you just got to just got to reach you got to go for it you, i think you nailed it but there, also you incorporated movement um dance in this it, i mean it was i thought it was just brilliantly um you know woven together uh, I'm really excited for people to see it and for, you know, what it means for your future work too in, in, in film and composition. So congratulations. Well, thanks. Yeah. I'm excited for people to see it too. And I think uh, the approach musically was really to try different stuff for me. Like there's, there's almost no acoustic guitar on this album. I didn't write the songs that way. I wrote them like at the console uh, or like the, you know, the keyboard or, you know, just being willing to go with like temp lyrics, which I'd never tried before. Like mm -hmm. just, you know, as the, this, the, uh, the, the storyteller or whatever, you're like, no, I'm just going to go with like, uh, I'm just going to try something here, like put something here for now and see, like, just, just let it be in pieces for a little bit, see what happens. Like it was just a really fun way to, to write. And I think it was really like a psychological game. Cause I think this record in many ways is one of my, well, if not my most personal record, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think there is a little bit of that thing you do where you're like, I'm going to kind of take the pressure off. I'm going to be like, I'm just going to try this and, and really convince yourself. Like I really was convinced I was just like trying that. And then that sort of lets you get more personal, right? You, you start, you know, you get out of patterns. You're not, you know, you're not, uh, uh, you, you're, there's no expectations and therefore you end up with something more interesting perhaps in the end. Can you tell us some, like some, some gossip about like, let's say your biggest challenge. Was there like a, a moment where you like almost broke down or you're just really frustrated in making close to the bone or was mm. it all just a walk in the park oh it was super easy <laughs> no challenges at all and uh maybe if your listeners are struggling they should just try to be more like me like that would yeah. be <laughs> a good idea for them that's my advice you can check out my self-help pamphlet because it's not very long because it just says that and uh you could join your fan club the yeah. foster children foster children yeah yeah <laughs> I love this is audio, so there's no visual cues. And people are like, wow, what an asshole. Jesus. Why would she even have him on? Um, uh, so sounds like more like a chat without heart. Am I right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, it was a long process. I mean, that's the thing with film. I mean, we musicians love to complain about like, oh, man, it can be hard when you're trying to wrangle all these musicians together in studio or like how long it takes to make a record. I mean, film is like, hold my beer, you know? It's like, <laughs> yeah. it could be years mm -hmm. to make a film because like, you're trying to scare up funding, you know, because it's very expensive. It's because of how collaborative it is. I mean, film to have like 30 people around is a small crew, you know, versus yeah. like a band and a producer and an engineer in studio is like pretty packed these days, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, so that, that was, that's interesting. And of course it's also uh, the, the actual filming is so like tip of the iceberg, you know, because like the, we shot the film in, in three days, you know, it's a 22 minute film. And we were able to do that because of the, like we had a lot of gimmies in the film, I would say. Mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is like, um, because we weren't recording sound, right. Um, uh, because we didn't need to, because it was, you know, the way you had, it's that. Not a, you know, yeah. b b with music, um, the, the nature of the sets and how some of the images, uh, like there's, it's all about, uh, cycles of an intergenerational family story. So there's like revisiting of sections. Like there was a lot of, like, just from the logistical standpoint of that, yeah. uh, it's like, there's problems and then there's like, there's pros and cons to any shoot, you know? And it's like, for us, those were some of the pros because you could move faster without having a sound recordist there, like for every single scene and things like that. We didn't have to slate everything because I was editing the film. So I already knew 
mm-hmm. where things needed to go. So there was like a fluidity there. So there was a lot of uh, advantages. And of course, like the disadvantages were really just about, um, uh, you know, trying to patchwork together the budget to make it happen, you know, um, and rewrites and trying to figure out because this is working in kind of a weird medium. Like there's not a ton of precedence for this. Like there's lots of visual albums say, but very quickly we were like, well, I don't think this is a visual album. Like this is not Pink Floyd's the wall. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like animation meets whatever, you know, it's like, it's, it's not that. Um, And, and we'd watched a whole bunch of similar projects and I definitely had inspirations for it, but it wasn't quite like any of those either. So it was, it was sort of like trying to figure out like what would work. What and the then, hell you know, is so this thing? what is the, what do we call it? What, how do we pitch it? Exactly. Yeah. Right. It, and, and the part of that, like it was being written while you're applying for funding because of the nature of funding and how far out it is. So, so there's so yeah. much, by the time you even get to day one, you know, it's, it's again, like with the music metaphors, it's like those shows that are like, you drove six hours, you got there, the PA wasn't set up. You set it up. You did your sound check. By the time you're about to actually do the thing, you're like, can I just go home? I'm really tired. Yeah. Can yeah. I just not, maybe I don't want to do this after all. Yeah. God. I've, I've put in the full day already <laughs> and I haven't even done the job yet. You know, I'm very quick to tell people it's not a pandemic album too, because I'm like, how quickly I watch now you're going to be like, I have an album coming out called pandemic, but like, it's, you know, I feel like we're already like, if someone's like, would you like to relive the despair of the COVID times? I'm like, can we give it a couple of can, decades? Yeah. Can look back <laughs> on, oh, I have, you know? a, I mean, I put out a song that I wrote before the pandemic that talks about wearing masks because uh, I was, it was just something I was starting to wear masks on planes. Cause I was just afraid to get catch a cold. Cause I was, I was catching a cold on tour yeah. And it was yeah, it's yeah. a song about fear and overcoming fear and yeah, blah, blah, blah. But like, um, yeah, there's that uh, if you've put out anything during the pandemic, it must be about the pandemic. But, uh, or just like people being like, it's so lonely and the walls are closing in and stuff. I'm like, okay. We all, we all know. We lived it. We all just went through it. It's the, there's no audience for this. This is the only like mono event that everyone in the world experienced. Like we all like we're relate to it, but like let's have the jazz age now. We just yeah. got through the 1918 pandemic. Now it's time for the jazz age of the 20s. So That's right. we need something different. But um, yeah, so I mean, this album started pre-pandemic. So there were so many delays, like with my co-producer, he lives in Toronto and uh uh, you know, there were, there were so many delays that like my mix engineer said something. He was like, you know, when you had to put the year at the end of the mix, <laughs> you know, the album is taking a long time. Well, how do you stay positive? Um, you know, in, in a world. I think it's quite clear. I don't. I think <laughs> it's, it's. <laughs> if you listen to close to the bone, you will right away know that this is not a man who has any ounce of optimism. That's it. It's uh, uh, hope. <laughs> for me, uh, I, I will say that um, uh, there was definitely some fascinating uh, sort of processes that came out of the pandemic for me. Early on, I remember sort of like I had I had a, a tour I just did that was originally slated for March 2020. I just did it in the fall of 2022. So it was, you know, years. Oh. Yeah, two and a half years later, I got to do this tour finally. But it was like the first week of the pandemic was when that tour was supposed to start. So I was an early pandemic adopter of Mm -hmm. life stopping, you know. And in the months that followed, I just remember working on Close to the Bone. And I remember remember just waking up in the morning being like, yeah, there's this virus. And of course, we all thought we were going to die for at least the first few months, you know. So kill our parents. This is this is not great. And then you'd read the paper, you'd be like, okay, fascism's on the rise. All right, some more good news. Uh, uh, you know, and then I'd be like, uh, time to go downstairs and tweak some synths, I guess, you know. And I was like, is this like a monk-like meditative thing for me? Like, I guess it was a really interesting uh moment for someone who'd been doing this line of work for, you know, I, I guess somewhere between 15 to 20 years at this point professionally and, and just being like, I still like this, or I still feel I have to do it for some reason. Cause there was certainly no good reason having read the daily paper and looking at where the world was at and having no idea if, and when music was going to come back, like how that was going to, going to work. 
and still feeling the need to go work on something, you know, that yeah. like, it's not like I had any plan for putting that record, this record out when that was all going on. Um, and so I was like, yeah, I still love this. Like, despite how challenging it can be day to day and despite uh, all the external factors that we have no control over, but still may sabotage a tour or a whole year or years of your professional career or whatever, mm -hmm. like at its core, I still, I still just, you know, want to fool around with sounds and make stuff, you know? And that was, that was kind of affirming. That was, you know, it was a pretty desperate way to find out, but it was still quite affirming. And I think one of the ways we connect is that we are similar that way. We have a lot of interests uh, and, um, and the, the, the ability in some cases to at least pursue them and hopefully excel at them, you know? And, uh, and if the interests are um, like, I've been, I'll speak for myself. Like I've been very lucky in that, I really love just being in the studio. It doesn't have to be all about me, right? And so therefore, like being a producer for other people scratches an itch. Like that's not mm -hmm. like, well, time to go make some money, I guess, to try to support the other thing. Like that's not how it works for me. Like mm -hmm. I'm like, this is fun. I can't believe I got paid to do this. Like it's one of those jobs kind of thing. And and it luckily, like it that comes honestly, but a benefit of it is that it obviously feeds back into what I do naturally anyway, right? Like you're the every record you work on, you just learn new things. It doesn't but you learn new things on your own record, but you also learn things working on someone else's record, even if that's like a different approach to a song or like you're you're tasked with like we're looking for this sound so you're delving into like an 80s synth sound maybe for the first time and then you're learning about that and again it's like you're paid to learn that you know you're paid to to be there and experience that which is like a dream you know that's so cool you know yeah. so um and then the same with film i mean like uh, you know for me that's just a um uh like compositionally, like that's very much like a, like a service in that same way as a producer, like you're, you're hired to score a film, you know, the films I'm making are like passion projects. Like they're, they're indie films, you know, I'm, I'm making very little, if any money, sometimes I'm losing money, you know, on trying to promote it or whatever. Uh, but again, it feeds back into my experiences to then be hired to make somebody else's music video or whatever. So it's like, there's so many parts. It's of course not just about the money, you know, like that's the thing. It's, it's like the holistic view of like, is this all stuff that excites me and can I find a way to make it all work in the capitalist world we live in? Cause it is somewhat about money, you know? So it's like, how do I uh, keep making a living and get to explore all these things? And yeah. when it's going well and by going well, I just mean getting to do it really. Like it's great when your album's reviewed well or, your film does something cool like that's obviously great but like when you're having that experience like there's nothing that feels kind of better than that where you're like wow i'm get to wake up this week and do three different things most people go to the same office like nine to five you know so like that is the you know that's the real answer to your question like 25 minutes ago about how do you remain optimistic i guess it's like trying to trying to look at it that way right it's like uh, uh and when that's working it's it's great and it also i think diversification also fights off the more dramatic swings in one's artistic career because let's face it like there's gonna be peaks and valleys right so if you were just a touring singer songwriter and that's all you did i mean march 2020 would have been a lot worse for me had that been literally the only thing that i did versus oh, yeah. like I did some remote production for people. I did some composing for film. I did other things during the pandemic, you know, it was still a drastic reduction in work, but it was still like some stuff happened. Like I had friends and I'm sure you did too. It was like, my God, like, what are we, uh, you know, what are oh. we going to do? Like you, you literally have nothing in your life anymore because as you know, you could, the people we know that are road dogs, like that's the only thing they do. You know, mm -hmm. their whole life is structured around that. So that's a lot, a lot of people in therapy, I think, as a result of that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people had to, you know, quit entirely and get other careers and just yeah. shut her down and maybe never return. Sadly, I mean, wow, this is really going downhill. Um, this is really dark down depressing but not us no 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 we survived uh well i've had but i've had to have i've had i've taken um you know part-time jobs that 
because I needed the financial security, you know, to, uh, and something that I very much feared and was overworking and maybe even doing some gigs that I would have liked to have, they just maybe weren't for right for me. I would have loved to have just said, no, thank you. But I couldn't because of my fear of not being able to pay the bills and going bankrupt and eventually going to prison. That's my thought. Uh, that's my thought process of but that just that comes from my my childhood trauma. That's another episode. Um I think that would be imagine if you picked up the paper one day and it was like songwriter fails and goes to prison. <laughs> I'm like, "Wow. Now that is a level of it not going well. That is more than I would have expected." Welcome to the Heartbeat Hotline, 1-902-669-4769. I'm the host of a Chat with Heart podcast, Christina Martin, and I'm so excited you called. Leave me your question, suggestion for the podcast, or a comment about this episode. Please be aware your message may be used on the podcast and social media. Tell me your name, where you're calling from, and it's also fine if you want to remain anonymous. Thanks for listening. Have a great fucking day. Thanks for listening to A Chat With Heart podcast. Produced and written by me, Christina Martin, and co-produced and engineered by Dale Murray. Check out Dale's website, dalemurray.ca. The podcast theme song, Talk About It, and I Don't Want to Say Goodbye to You, were written by me and recorded by Dale Murray. You can find my music on Bandcamp and all the places you stream music. Visit my Patreon page to become a monthly or yearly supporter of this podcast and my music endeavors. If you're new to Patreon, it's a membership platform that helps creators get paid. Sign up at patreon.com backslash Christina Martin. I would love it if you had time to share, rate, leave a review, and subscribe to A Chat With Heart on all the places you listen to podcasts. Wishing you, my little heartbeats, a great day.